Hello, Legionnaires, and welcome to some Rando RPG livestream. Tonight, our panel of Dungeon Masters, Game Masters, Referees, Storytellers, and Players will share their diverse tabletop role-playing game experiences to provide ideas, suggestions, and possibly even some advice for your tabletop RPG sessions. I hope you're ready to take some notes. I know I am. So let's get started. All right, welcome to the Some Rando RPG Livestream. I am John Maxley Oshlow, your host. And I'm truly grateful that you're with us for tonight's live stream on why... How are they going to convince me to love... No, why, why should you I, or anyone play the Rifts RPG by Palladium Books? I was told I keep this on the stream too long, so I'm going to stare at you while I read my script. That's right, reading. So what do we do here on Some Rando RPG Live Stream? Well, in segments one through four... We discuss ta topics surrounding the tabletop, a role-playing game hobby, with an emphasis on individual experiences, desires, and expectations. In tonight's four segments on why you, I, or anyone should play the Rifts RPG by Palladium Books, we hope to provide ideas, suggestions, and food for thought for your tabletop RPG sessions. And if you stick around for it in segment five, we look down our hair and just talk about nerd issues of interest, maybe rant, maybe laugh. I don't know. We'll do things. Uh, and if there's a giveaway, if we meet that threshold, which I'll discuss in a moment here, we will do that during segment five. Please consider supporting Legion of Myth through the links in the live stream's description, which reminds me, guys, can you put your YouTube channels? I didn't add it uh, in the private chat, and I'll get them added to the, or Substacks or whatever you want, and I'll get that uh, added to the description so these fine, awesome people watching can find you. If you're watching this on video later, they're already there. Uh, YouTube takes 30% and Twitch takes 50% of your hard-earned money, while Rumble, PayPal, Streamlabs, and Ko-Fi take between 0 and 5% of your donation. As always, Rumble rants and Super Chats, less than... Uh-oh, talk... Oh, my God. Oh, the Rumble people are going to be angry with me. Hold on. Hold on. There we go. We're live on Rumble now. <laughs> my bad! Sorry! Oops. Uh, anyway, Rumble Rants and Super Chats of less than $20. I will read at the end of each segment. $20 or more, I will interrupt the segment to read your rant or chat as immediately as I can. I'm going to let somebody finish his, you know, his thought first. You know, At $50 or more, I should have brought the shot glass in here because this actually happened the last couple times. I will drink in your name and you can force a panel to answer any tabletop RPG related question of your choice right then and there. Not like a seven-parter either. Just one question. Uh, if we make $100 or more in Super Chats or Rumble Rants, there will be a 25 nay, $75 Palladium Books or drive through RPG gift card giveaway during Segment 5 towards the end of live stream. Legion Myth YouTube members as well as tonight's Super Chatters and Rumble Ranters have the opportunity to win, but you must be watching at the time of the giveaway to claim your victory. And it is that. You will be claiming because you will be standing atop of all the corpses of the people you defeated in Ultimate Arena. Else it rolls over to the next week. Don't forget that Legion of Myth moderators will time out or even ban people who attack any panelists or chatter. Attack the argument, not the person, and keep the various social media beefs off my show. And to answer a couple of YouTube commentaries that have been out there, no, I'm not against ranting. No, I don't take back anything I said in the past. And no, I'm not embarrassed of any of it. Times have changed. Things are different now, but if you really need me to rant, come back in segment five. I'm sure I can find one for you. We just don't want to have that on this. We want this to be relatively friendly friendly here. I've actually had people ask me to you know, lessen up on the cussing when it comes to the panelists, and we're going to do that for you. So that's all it is. So please like this video and subscribe to all of the panelists' channels that you will soon find in the description. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and support. Okay, with all of that out of the way, who do we have with us tonight? Well, starting on the top row here, we have a Francois, or Frank, I'm sorry, that's right, we go with Frank now, he's good old American, he's <laughs> Frank from down south. <laughs> uh, works, yep. And I think today you need to kind of shill your book for, at least for a second, so people can know how deeply vested you are with the Palladium system, but who are you, what content or products do you create, and what is your tabletop RPG experience? Okay, so uh, I've been playing the tabletop RPGs since uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. So back when D&D &D still had Thaco um, and the Splat books. Uh, played the Palladium system with uh, Robotech. Uh, played through all the generations with my uh, friends back in uh, junior high. Uh, and then moved on to Star Wars and then obviously moved into Rifts. Uh, Rifts obviously has been the mainstay of my interest, and in terms of the Palladium system, 
it always seems to come back to to rifts as well. Uh, and as Max said, um, I was the um, the the author of the World Book for Free Quebec. Uh, at the time, that was in the heyday of Palladium, um, when they were they, everybody knew about rifts. Uh, we're also pumping out like a lot of books, a lot of books. And I thought, okay, well, if someone's going to write something about, uh, you know, the Quebec experience, um, I'm, I'm going to damn well make sure at least I give my attempt to be that guy. And thankfully, uh, Kevin gave me the contract to provide the manuscript and largely pretty much everything I handed over to him was uh, put into print. And I was absolutely gobsmacked with the artwork, uh, both on the cover from Zelesnik and the interior artwork from everybody that contributed. Um, and, and I won't bother going through all the names, but uh, some fantastic artwork. I was happy with everything that came out of that. Uh, since then, I've been uh, you know, in and out with uh, Palladium and uh, just recently started getting into third party content creation with my blog, uh, which is Scholarly Adventures, uh, which is not a video uh, source, it's, it's a print media, visual media, uh, but I do advice to new GMs and players, um, some advice columns on how to use the Palladium system specifically for rifts, creating engaging adventures, uh, maximizing the use of different monsters and whatnot, uh, the use of character classes, even the non-combat ones, um, mm -hmm. and then a bunch of book reviews. So pretty much every single book for the rifts line uh, I've done the review for, uh, as well as most of the Dimension books. Uh, there's about 160 some odd articles on there for you to read. Uh, so by all means, uh, scholarlyadventures.com uh, and off we go. Now, I have not read all of them, but I have read a bunch of them. I have more to go, and I would say that, yes, you should. If you're a Rifts fan, you should be reading it. Watch our videos. Read his uh, his blog. You'll notice that sometimes we have similar takes. Sometimes we have diametrically opposite takes. But that's what's awesome about the hobby, What about the, about the fans and so forth. But the idea for you is food for thought. Do you like what we said? Do you like what he said? Do you like somewhere in the middle? And I, I really do suggest that you check out Scholarly Adventures. Now, below him, we have Timothy Ferelli. Hello, Timothy Ferelli. Welcome back to the show. Who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? Hello, I'm Timothy Ferelli. I have Character and Dice, where we make characters, so you don't have to. I've been gaming since the mid-90s. I started with 2nd uh, Edition, AD&D. &D. Went uh, in the Air Force, went to Palladium. Uh, played D6 Star Wars, played Marvel, played a wide range of games. And I've always come back to, Pal to Palladium, to Rifts, to Fantasy, uh, running a Dinosaur Swamp game. Uh, for my normal game Saturday nights, uh, starting that. So uh, those are less my those are my RPG chops all over the place. But Palladium's my is my part of my soul. As as we're gonna find out as we go along here tonight, you're gonna learn pretty quickly that I'm not a Rifts guy. I love Palladium books. I have <laughs> Rifts is not made for me, but Dinosaur Swamp. I actually did the the overview of that one, and that book is fantastic. And you can take it anywhere, like after the bomb, where good people play. Still Palladium, after the bomb. <laughs> all right, <laughs> Malachi. Uh, who are you? By the way, all the links are now in the description, so you guys should be able to check them out. Uh, who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? Hey, I'm Malachi. I started in the uh, early 90s when I found, well, when a friend of mine in high, in actually it's junior high, was reading some Dragonlance, checked it out and just got into D&D &D that way. Moved on to, got into Rifts in college, and just been jumping around ever since. Okay. I got a, I got a blog. You said it's a description. Uh, I don't haven't really been doing a theme or anything it's just been whatever's been getting in my head what i think needs to come out cool we'll check that out again you can find a sub stack in the description all right we let's get this on the road now get this on the i don't know what i'm saying it's gonna be one of those nights i'm just gonna jabber and all right first question we will start with frank up there what sets Rifts apart from other RPGs in terms of its setting and world building? And how do you utilize these features in your games? I, 
R Rifts do, and and this is uh, you know kudos to Kevin for this one and and the other writers that provided for the the world books throughout. Uh, the world building is is top notch. It's one of the better ones that I've seen out there. There are other games that do world building really well. Um, I just found that the way that Palladium puts together their world books and uh, supports the Rifts genre and the setting, um, it's just so expansive that you can include everything and and. You know, you guys call it the kitchen sink uh, RPG every once in a while. Other people have as well. And that's that's not a disparagement to it, um, mm. but it does provide some context for uh, some some trouble that you might get into if you're just jumping into rifts for the first time. Um, and and I, I'm totally on board with that. And I understand why someone would have that trepidation. Um, but it does give you a lot of realism and room to play with various themes. Um, because it is set on Earth, uh, it allows you to touch and uh, touch and go with uh, a lot of different areas, a lot of different themes, a lot of different things that you can leverage. Uh, specifically, something like just playing in your own backyard. Um, you're playing in a base out in Germany. You pick the local town and you start playing with the familiar settings that you have. Uh, at that time, if you're living in, uh, you know, upstate New York uh, or, uh, you know, South Dakota, whatever the case may be, there is something there that you can leverage and uh, kind of make it your own. Um, it's it's not D&D &D as well. So the challenge for um, picking a monster and a conflict that you can throw your characters into where they might not have fully read the monster manual and memorized exactly what it is that you got to do to defeat X, Y or Z um, is, is something that I found refreshing as well, and that you can launch something into uh, against your characters, your, your player characters, and uh, they will have, like, it is a true response to something that is horrific. They don't know what it does, and they have to figure it out as they make do their attacks and, and try and understand what it is that's going on in the context of whatever the adventure is. And the adventure, like I said, can, can be... Um, as wide ranging or as limited as you want to make it, whatever works for your table. And I found that a, 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 an, an incredibly refreshing setting at the time when it came out. And I've just been working with it ever since. Okay. I, I made kind of a faux pas here. So before I ask you a follow up question, I should let people know that we're in segment one. <laughs> the, the, uh, the concept of this segment is unique features and appeal of riffs. So uh, sorry, sorry about that. I mean, he answered the question because I asked it and I forgot to say what the context was for folks out there. Um, now, for your follow up, um, how does the like the multi genre or I don't know how I want to say this. I'm going to go with that term, but you know, you have like Rifts Japan, which has temporal issues. You have a uh, dinosaur swamp that uh, Timothy Frehley said that he's going to be running soon, uh, which got the survival elements. And then again, time warps. I don't know why I picked that twice. We got a little time warps in there, uh, but you have these different areas with these different genres, uh, this new West with, you know, your spittoon cyborgs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never going to let the drop. Uh, yeah. Spaghetti Western. You know, so how does that aspect enhance the gameplay experience for you and your players? Because if if you're if you're uh, listening to what your players are are putting in front of you in terms of their interest, what they're looking for, um, f you know, and we'll get into this in the second segment, I think, <clears throat> that from the character generation, um, there there are themes, there are places from Rifts Earth that are going to sat, you know, they're going to scratch that itch for anybody that wants to play the game. If you're into Arthurian legends. There's Rift England. If you're into Spaghetti Western, like we said, there's New West. If you're into the uh, Japanimation and the, the the mechs and all of that, or the samurai theme, we've got Japan and and the China books that can get that uh, get that for you. And then there's just big monsters and big mechs and dinosaurs galore. I mean, like like I said, it's kitchen sink. So there is a smorgasbord of things that you can throw in there. Um, and it doesn't have to be high tech all the time. You can go high magic. You can bring something in from a different game, uh, TMNT, Palladium Fantasy, uh, you know, the, the, after the bomb, uh, whatever the case may be. And that character will function in rifts uh, for better or for worse. 
Um, but it but it does provide you that adaptability to to allow somebody to play anything that they pretty much want. It's funny you said that because you mentioned Mystic China. I mean, yeah. there's a debate whether Mystic China is meant for riffs or is it meant for ninjas and super spies? Who cares? It's meant for both. <laughs> it, 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 you can certainly leverage it for both. Uh, you know, I have my opinion, but uh, you know, if if you at your table decide that that book fits your rifts scenario, Bob's your uncle. Who am I to tell you that it, it, it's not for me to tell you it's wrong? It's your table. Carry on. Uh, you know, one of the things. No, actually, no. I'll save that in case. Uh, let me save that note. Okay. Um, so let's move down to Timothy Ferrelli. Timothy, sir, you're going to get the same uh, main question, which is what sets Rifts apart from other RPGs in terms of setting and world building, and how do you utilize these features in your games? Uh, Frank, really, he nailed it. Part of it is that it's Earth. You don't have to think too much. You know what's here. But that that's why it's, it's that's the part the good part is you know what's here it may not be in the book but it's it's still here it's probably not in the book. florida's probably been destroyed not. and you know the major cities that used to know and love are gone but that's also the fun of it <laughs> hey ocala will still be here we'll still be making fire trucks i don't care what anybody says <laughs> but that's my riffs um mm -hmm. And, and you can utilize this in your campaigns. Uh, also, if you, if they allow it in here that if whatever you're going into is not going to fit, change, you definitely change it because they have in the lore that the landscape has changed. Uh, and I mean, Max, your well, your home state's now infested with bugs. Why, why so, do you keep reminding me of that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, because I'm in the swamp, we got bugs, you got bugs. I think there's a commonality here, okay? I mean, the Minnesota uh, state bird is a mosquito, but, you know, <laughs> that now, now it's excessive. <laughs> so uh, that's the, that's why, that's the best of the beauty of the setting. It works. You don't, ha you don't have to relearn. You don't have to learn anything new. It's Earth. You know what's, where's Earth. You know where uh, San Diego is on the, up in the water you know where atlanta is you know where new york city is but the players and they're not going to know what ha what happened they're not going to know the state of new york city they're not going to know the state of san diego so it's there and you can use it or change it you said that and i don't know why but also i was thinking well yeah it's new york and it's uh <laughs> roadhogs i mean we know what happened what are you talking about oh wait <laughs> We're talking riffs. Um, since we're talking about uh, the world building, the setting, and so forth, I want to ask kind of an off-the-wall question for you, which is uh, what role do you think the art and illustrations in riffs play in attracting and immersing players in the game? It does play a big part. Um, I love I love John's, uh, the artist, John uh, Zendik, I believe his name. I love his work. Um, there's, but there is some aspects that are just a little bit too, um, and this isn't, this isn't just John, uh, this is a theme. It's just too, it is still too, I, I don't want to say eighties, but there's just, just a bit off for me, but it still makes, it still presents with you what, um, what, what it is high tech. You know, you got the high tech, and you've got the freak. You got the um, um, mysticals, and you've got animals. I mean, the drawings, the art of the dinosaurs are just gorgeous. Uh, the it helps it helps solidify what what's there. I mean, let's be honest. You look at that the original Rifts cover, you know, with the Splugar slavers on there and the slave girls. Tell me how many people didn't buy the book just for the cover of the book? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of good art. I think that the art actually does set the tone. Like, you know, uh, when, when I was mentioning the comment to Frank, you know, like the spaghetti Western stuff, like I don't like spaghetti Westerns, but if you do the art style of new West plays right into that. And it definitely evokes the feel every, you know, again, as the not riffs guy, when heathen dog, usually heathen dog, I've done a couple goes through these settings. I look at, you know what? It's on the tin. 
<laughs> if you got vampire kingdoms, the book is full of vampires, and, and it's the the concepts behind it. Rift's Chaos Earth. That's something we do need to cover again in the future. Uh, the cover is evocative of what the setting is about and the art inside of it, whether, you know, the glitter boys, whether it's, you know, scientists, whether it's Emperor Prozac or whatever the heck his name is, they, mm -hmm. they are all evocative of, of what the setting is. Is it the best? Is it all Keith Parkinson art? No, we wish it was, but, it, but it isn't. But uh, whether it's simple line art or it's uh, the, the awesome covers, it instantly should give you a feel of what you're looking at. I haven't found a cover. I mean, there's some covers that were like, eh, about. But none of them have been like, this isn't what the book is about at all. It's, uh, covers like this, art like this, is it's, it's inspirational. You know, when, you, when you're when you going into a Risk game or in a Chaos Earth game, you're like, America, patriotism, and defend, defense, home and country. And there it is right there. And, you know, leads to coalition state. But, you know, it, it sets the tone for the players. You know, that's what you strive to be, defending defending it at all costs. All right, let's slide on over to Malachi here. Malachi, what sets Rifts apart from other RPGs in terms of its setting and world building? And how do you utilize these features in your games? Well, you stole my thunder with your follow-up there for Red Aww. Squad. Aww. And what... It, when you look at the different places throughout the world, you have these different themes. And I think that's a really big thing with Palladium. Like, you go to Dinosaur Swamp, it's all about survival. That's mm -hmm. the big thing. Japan, you have that dichotomy of the uh, high-tech stuff with the feudal past. You know, Chai Town's your cyberpunk type set. You can, even if you can find a spot of the wastelands, you can do like a Mad Max thing. And that is I think one of the highlights of Palladium. And, oh, hugs. I'm sorry. <laughs> and piggybacking off what T uh, Timothy was saying is when you look at a lot of your places on Earth now, you can actually put some of that stuff into Rift's Earth. One of my the coolest things is in the Dinosaur Swamp. You can see this uh, stuff in Cape Canaveral sticking up out of the water. You can see the tower of a castle out in the ocean. And you know what castle that is. It's a Disney castle. And uh -huh. they talk about all the underground tunnels there. You can run a dungeon crawl through the underground of Disneyland or Disney World. If you well, want. Atlanta had some too, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I think that diversity uh, of uh, of play styles is good, and I think we're going to get in that at some point. I am doing a live stream right now. There's no time for cute kitties. Um, so my follow-up for you then, since since you, we'll, we'll keep you on the topic, hopefully, yeah. uh, is how does the technological diversity in Rifts, from ancient artifacts to futuristic gear, uh, you know, magic psionics, uh, rune weaponry, which do exist in Rifts as well, influence your game and your planning? Oh, Got to read a rumble rant first. Okay. And one day, StreamYard, which is bilking people out of money, so please, oh, I don't have it in the description right now. Well, in the video side, it'll be in the description. Please support Legion of move over to Restream because uh, StreamYard is uh, over doubling the price. Um, Grizzly Beardo on a rumble for $20. Thank you very much, Grizzly Beardo. Do appreciate that. Backyards Riffs for the win. One throwaway line in an adventure I read 30 years ago, which established that my hometown survived the rifts. My imagination was off to the races. Now, my hometown technically has survived so far, as far as I know, because it's northern Minnesota that's messed up. I'm from just east of the Twin Cities. So I think I'm I think my family's safe. But you know what? I don't like bugs, and I don't want to be anywhere near there. So I live in Dinosaur Swamp now. But thank you very much, Grizzly Bureau. Now, just to, to read it, I'll, I'll say the question again for, for you, Malachi. Um, How's the technological diversity and rifts from ancient artifacts to futuristic gear influence your game planning? Well, I mean, it's going to influence what kind of uh, adventure you're going to tell. You, if for, I'm going to use the Japan because I think that's going to be the easiest one for me. Like, if you want to... If you want to focus really on that high tech, the sci-fi stuff, you're going to be wanting to stick over on the, was it on the, was it Tokyo that got suspended in a like a rift or whatever? Yeah, Tokyo did. Yeah, and, but if you want to do like your feudal stuff, you're going to have to go over to the other side of of Japan. You know, it just it's a lot of knowing 
what you want to do and where that's at and focusing on those places. Okay. Anything that you guys want to ask each other or mention, piggyback on, so forth before we uh, move on here? I just want to say this cover did not make me buy the game. Yeah, I, I could say that the, the cover wasn't the reason I bought. I actually bought the game because of a comic book that I had that had the old Kevin Long art for the Cyber Knight with the, uh, you know, the, the little write up that they had in the, the, the back pages. And a buddy of mine in one of my classes picked up the book. I looked at it and I went, that looks a lot like the Robotech that I used to play. What okay. the heck is going on here? Same Kevin Long art. And yeah. I went, wait a second. Okay. I'm going to latch on to this. Um, and it's been great adventures ever since. And one of the things that was really, really captivating in the early days of Rifts into the heyday um, was the idea that you had all these major players, uh, the plot, you know, the major muscle movements in terms of plot. You got your coalition states here. You had Free Quebec there. You had the Federation of Magic down here, Tolkien up in a corner. The New West was just this unknown expanse. Uh, and there's little spots of civilization that you can key into. And this vast expanse that as a game master, you can put anything in between. And most of those places had hundreds of miles, hundreds of kilometers of space in between. And if you're going to go through uncharted territory, which is basically what you're talking about, um, you can stick anything in there, any kind of conflict, any kind of monster um, a dungeon crawl in a newly discovered shopping mall, uh, which is one of my favorite things to do, do a dungeon crawl into a shopping mall. And all of a sudden, they're trying to figure out what this, what the heck is serious, you know, a Walmart thing. Uh, you know, what is this store? Like, it's a smorgasbord of things. Useless crap, maybe. But that, that might just be exactly what they need to trade with the black market to purchase what they need for the next adventure and the next adventure and off they go. Uh, and maybe they have to defend that find because somebody else wants to go and loot it and make money off of it, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's infinite possibilities both within those centers of civilization and in between. And that's the balls are the perfect dungeons to use in risk because you know they're yeah. there you know what their layouts are yeah. so it's it's yeah. already all the heavy lifting is done for you and i've sent some fantasy or or uh, characters that i drifted in for a brief time down them all to get stuff yep have it hook up to a subway system and off you go there, there there's your dungeon crawl uh, and quite frankly i think it's a a more immersive experience than any that you could find in like, you know, maybe the D20 systems where it's like, oh, you're going down into a mountain and you're just going to pre, uh, you know, uh, pre, pre chart what they're going to look at. Um, how many, how many underground mountain dungeon crawls can you do? Um, you can do a lot uh, if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, but I found that, uh, you know, by, by using things like shopping malls, skyscrapers that were off onto their side, yeah. half buried, um, things like that, that, that allows you a three-dimensional aspect to your game, uh, makes, makes for some really immersive gameplay and really gets the players jazzed up and engaged. And, and you're not really restricted in creatures either. If you have a special opponent, you have the wide open. Like, um, you want something that breathes fire? You want a dog that breathes fire? Go ahead and do it. You know, it can be there. It, you're, you're, you're more than just your goblins, your gnolls, your trolls, it, what, however you want to design it, you have those opponents that your characters, your players will not know anything about it because there's it doesn't exist until you make it. One of my favorite maps to use, and I can't grab it right now, but I have a map of the Paris Underground. I love using that for uh, for fantasy settings. I'll use aspects of it for sci-fi. <laughs> I made a space station based on it one time. Like, uh, but uh, it's there's a great there are great maps out there. The Paris Underground that you guys can use as well. And when I say you guys, obviously these guys here have their own imagination. I'm just talking in general for everybody that people can use out there. Uh, I suggest. There's another one. I just can't remember what is some cave system that's supposed to be really good to use. I mean, yeah, I mean, go Carlsbad yep. Caverns, just as an example. Oh, uh, yep. Tennessee's got some good cave systems. 
actually Google is your friend for this. You can go onto Google and just do uh, underground copper mine and you Ooh. will find the schematics for an underground copper mine and you can leverage that for your gameplay. Uh, you want to use the Toronto um, path system, which integrates all the skyscrapers of Toronto with an underground way of moving about. You've got that Montreal has an underground city. Most major cities have an underground city that you can leverage. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like Google's your friend for that. And military bases. That too. Great places for a lot of the equipment that you need, like Glitter Boys and whatever. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, there were no super chats during segment one. Well, except for the one that we read. Thank you again, Grizzly Beardo. So I think we're going to, by the way, I am reading the chat. Um, if there's something really awesome, I'll put it on the screen. Other than that, you guys keep chatting. Uh, I do appreciate it. A lot of good comments out there. But I think we're going to move on to uh, the second segment. Before I do that, where'd my note go? Um, I just want to remind, or not remind folks, I want to announce to folks. Now, if you're watching this on video later, it's too late. I'm sorry. But you can find the videos, hopefully. <laughs> on October 6th, Kevin and Sean should be coming back to RPG Digest on Sunday. And we are going to talk about... Uh-oh, uh what are we talking about? <laughs> I forgot what we're talking about. Um, wilderness travel in yeah. Rifts. Apparently, that's an issue. A lot of people don't understand that there's wilderness travel in rifts or something. I, 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 my mind was blown when they told me that, yeah, that came up a bunch. Like people don't understand that rifts is a lot of wilderness. I'm like, I've, you know, to be fair, I haven't played 30 years of rifts, but I have played a bunch of it. All of my adventures were pretty much in the wilderness. What, where is this coming from? So they're going to talk about that. And then the other one, I, I forget what this other segment is. It's either on Mega Damage uh, versus uh, STC or it's going to be on OCCs. And I forgot. I should know, but uh, I, I'm, I'm a bad host and I came unprepared. But we're, the point is we're going to be talking about game concepts. And I'm just going to put it out there right now. If you ask a question like, when's the next product coming out? We're skipping that question and moving on. We are not going to talk about products when they come on unless they demand that I let you, which they might. But uh, we're going to talk about game aspects. We're going to talk to Kevin the Gamer and Sean the Gamer, and we're going to find out gaming things about Rifts. Uh, so, all right, let's move on to the second question here, which we'll start with Timothy Ferrelli on this one. So what do you find most compelling about the character creation process. I mean, you got a channel on character creation, so uh, <laughs> now it's time to tell us what is so exciting about that. Uh, what's compelling about the character creation process in Rifts, and how does it impact the overall game? It's so custom. It is very customizable. Uh, you know, you have, say, for example, you have two Cyber Knights, but they're not going to be the same Cyber Knights because the skills, they, they're going to focus differently. Um, same thing you know, IT people, we're, we're all IT, but we're not the same IT. I am a system admin in real life. I just pretend, actually, I pretend one. But um, you, it's the how you build it, uh, how you, what you select, what your their goals are, what their hobbies are, is what I enjoy quite a bit. There's uh, stats to a small extent, you know, be the off chance of being able to get a high 20 stat that's that's freaking phenomenal uh, that's going to give you a lot of bonuses um and uh, how it uh, relate uh, how that impacts the game it's going to impact um you know with uh, with what you do uh you know the if going going down to the shopping mall if you have uh, like computer use skill as a operator which you i think you do um then you're going to you might be able to log in into Sears and you know get some worthless information, but you know you're you're exploring what's going on, what happened in Sears the day before, and develop that lore as you as you progress. Um, and how you use your it's also how you use your skills uh, that it, you might be able to see that uh, as an operator using computer use that the alarm system is rigged to set off an explosive, so you disarm that. And makes life a little bit easier on you, whereas a cyber knight without computer use wouldn't necessarily see that, and they might trigger it. So most of it is, it's the, the biggest thing is skill customization. Um, and it's it really, really affects your, your character and the world. How does the concept of, if you can imagine it, you can be it, 
pertain to riffs? Because there are so many different classes that it's you it's easy you can with a little bit of legwork you can find uh what you're looking for um one of the biggest gaps uh, in my opinion uh other than the tw the techno wizard is crafting of magical atoms well mystic russia really has has the class in there the mystic kuznia that fills that itch for me it, i that is, I love that class. <laughs> Being able to punch anybody and 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 make magical weapons, I that's that I find that enjoyable. Um, so you and it could be in any setting. You just just have to flavor it slightly different. So uh, how, you using that that uh, that idea though how. Okay, let's just arbitrarily say you're going to run a game, and I'm like, I got this great idea for a class. So how does one create a new OCC uh, for folks out there, occupational character class? It's how the classes are in most Palladium games. Uh, how, how does one create a new class or a race and effectively balance, if that's even a thing in Rifts, uh, to, to the setting of Rifts? Like, if I have this great idea, I want to do this thing, how, how would we implement that? No, we, I would try to find something that's close to it. And then we would uh, tweak the skills. Like for example, a lot of times when it comes to secondary skills, I do like to ignore limitations because they're your hobbies. I mean, they're supposed to be outside of, within reason, they're supposed to be outside of other of your normal class limitations. For example, um, you might have um, somebody that likes languages as a blacksmith i mean so but um really to make a new occ okay, i have oh, here, here's an example and i kind of know this is already out there or no actually i think that was aliens unlimited either way uh i want to play the predator mm -hmm. so how, how do we put the predator in your game or a game. Um, it doesn't have to be yours. I mean, if your answer is like, I don't allow stuff like that, that's fine. But I'm just saying, because again, you know, if I can dream it, I can, I can become it, right? If I can imagine it, I can be it. Uh, how, how, how could I put something like a predator in your game or in a game? A bio cyborg was, was the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, bio cyborg with uh, enhancements. Um, that's the first, that's my first thought until I sat down and really noodled it out. So... Okay. All right, we'll move on over to Malachi. Malachi, we're going to ask you the same uh, primary question. What do you find most compelling about the character creation process in Rifts, and how does it impact the overall game? For me, it's stat rolling. Depending on what race you are, you may not be rolling 3d6 for your stats. You may have to roll 2d6, or you may get to roll 4d6. And then when you get to a certain number, like, what is it, 15 on a 3d6? You get to roll a d6 and add it to get a bigger number. You could even break a 20 if you're lucky enough. What's neat about that is, well, I should say, then, you know, the stats is you really don't get many bonuses, only if you get over a, a 16 or higher. But it's just purely to help you get your OCC. It's requirements for that. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna save that one, Frank. <laughs> so for uh, for Malachi, how do occupational character classes, the OCCs, appeal to players who prefer class-based system and players who uh, prefer skill-based systems? Well, uh, Palladium, I think, is the system that nailed a blending of classes and the skills base, uh, blending a class-based and a skill-based game together. You know. Your OCC can determine what skills you can take. And once you get down the line, you get to get a broad range of skills. And that really rounds out your character. Uh, but, you know, your class is going to determine what main skills you get and how the bonus you get for the skills. Okay. So I got to write down notes here as chat comes in and I have comments. <laughs> All right. Uh... We'll move on over to uh, Frank then, and uh, I got to... Oh, my God. 
I can't handle my own stream anymore. I, I'm you curious about who the redhead is that they were talking about. Uh, Harmony Ginger was on last week when we were talking Watsy versus uh, uh, TSR. And, okay. you know, there's a girl on the show. Bring her back. No, I'm not saying that's what he's saying. No, she was actually awesome. And for folks who haven't had a chance to watch it yet, oh, well, when it goes live in a couple of weeks, um, it was a really good discussion. And and I loved her takes on stuff. Didn't agree with all of them, but I, I loved her takes on that stuff. So she yeah, did a really good job for her first time on the show. What was what. <laughs> no problem. Uh, she, so, says, she says thank you. No, thank her. She made the show well, better. So that chat was asking about her. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, what do you find most compelling about the character creation process in Rifts, and how does it impact the overall game? This one I had to think uh, a little bit about, and, and my first, my, my gut reaction was, it's not D&D. &D. And, and that was my first thought, it's not D&D. &D. You, you don't have strength, dex, con, wisdom, and charisma. You, you're off from that. So the Character creation process, um, from that perspective, uh, already sets things on edge. Um, it, it's, it, it stirs things up, and characters have to think a bit more about their characters. And if anybody who's played Rifts understands, you can spend hours doing deep dives into your character to try and do that optimization of your skills with your capabilities. And then if you chose a psionic or a magic caster, Hey, hey, that's the follow-up, sir. You stand by for that. <laughs> yep, it's it's practitioner of magic. Um, you, you you've got the book of magic that you're going to end up spending probably another half hour going through trying to figure out what spells you're going to take, uh, and you're going to spend probably another half hour asking questions about applications of how does this spell work in your world? Can I do this with that spell? Um, that said, it's not the only post-apocalyptic setting out there. Um, I find that it's one of the ones that provides for game masters the greatest amount of flexibility and for players the greatest amount of room to uh, develop a character to their specific idea and hmm. then provide them something that is not based on a tech tree that you can find on a sub stack that tells you what the optimized build is for moving forward with your character class. Um, which, which is one of the things that I find really, really um, not, not, not troublesome, but I, I find it problematic when I think about building something in a D20 system. And I was like, I've got a concept for a character. And then uh, I didn't pick that certain feat at a certain level. Well, you're, you're not going to be an optimized ranger. Yep. Like, <laughs> I don't care. Um, the <laughs> fact that there are over 400 OCCs in Rifts writ large across all the different books that you can choose. Um, provides you more than enough of a baseline to find something to play. Um, from there, you can go down into the different deep dives for the different world books, like uh, World Book Canada does a deep dive on Headhunters. Juicers Uprising provides you a whole bunch of different subclasses of juicers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can go into... Uh, the different the different books and find something that will develop your concept further, but you don't need all seventy some odd books to play rifts. Um, just the ones that are in Ultimate Edition provide more than enough of a baseline for incoming game masters and play testers or guys that just want to dip their toe into rifts and find out what this is all about. Uh, Ultimate Edition and maybe two or three more books and you're golden. Um, because when we talk about skills and specialization and selectivity of all the different class capabilities, whether it's psionics, magics, cybernetic implants, what robot or big stompy robot do you want to pilot? Or a uh, vehicle do you want to pilot? Um, what languages do you want to speak based off of what region you're going to? All of that is stuff that could take uh, an entire day if you let it. Um, but it's very easy to tone things down. And I'm kind of jumping into section three, I think, where we talk about how this is uh, not something that you have to allow every aspect. Get into the game first with Rift's Ultimate Edition, the baseline classes, the skills that are there, and then start adventuring. And then present things that provide a challenge to the character class that is not something that they've memorized from 
you know, Pathfinder or, uh, you know, D&D or any other, you know, Star Wars or whatever the system it is that you're used to playing, uh, you know, take it as a palate cleanser and just mm -hmm. have an adventure. Yeah, I think uh, we're definitely going to look at some of the challenges, I think, in the next segment. Um, but the follow up I wanted to have with you was uh, and you I, I love it. These guys don't know the follow ups. They do know the primary questions, but they don't know the follow ups because sometimes yeah, yeah. I come up with them on my own and sometimes, you know, I prepare them. And uh, in this case, so you brought it up. So what do you think of the magic and psionic systems in Rifts and how do they compare to other RPGs that you played? I thought that was something in Section three. No, sure, that was a question in segment three, um, but that's uh, fine. Let me um, see. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fine. I remember making notes about this, so it, it's fairly easy. I can just scroll through my notes here. Um, the, the one thing I like about the magic system and the psionics, uh, they're, they're kind of part and parcel. They, they both use a, um, a fuel-based system, if you want to call it that, a point-based system where characters have a certain amount of uh, resources uh, in terms of points, and every spell that you cast costs a certain amount, and every psionic power that you use costs a certain amount, and you subtract that from your starting total. And when you run out, you cannot cast any more spells, you cannot cast any more psionic powers, or, or use any psionic powers. But there are ways that you can draw PPE, the uh, magic energy, and ISP for your psionics um, from other sources. So it's not like, uh, you know, the, the famous D20 system where you got your wizards and they've got their classes and they've got their certain spells per level. They memorize and then they use them uh, and then they go into their short rest and their long rest and they rememorize based off of what it is that they want to do. Um, the one thing that I, I, I dislike about the D20 system in that case, uh, and this might be completely irrelevant now that the new pro player's handbook has come out. Um, is the fact that a mage only has X number of spell slots and can only memorize a certain number of spells per level. Uh, whereas in Rifts, if you have six first level spells, you can cast them as many times as you have that uh, psychic energy fuel source to move forward. Uh, once you run out of that, you're, you're stuck. And, and now you've got to be more creative. How are you going to draw from the surroundings your, your other players. Um, there, there's ways of, you know, uh, tapping into that emergency reserve per se, um, but there's restrictions on that. And that's something that the game master then can, can play around and start adding into that level of immersiveness and the level of, um, you know, tension, typing, please uh, mute. The, the, the tension that you're dealing with, uh, you can really start playing around with your characters and making the adventure that much more uh, immersive and 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 uh, you know enjoyable by giving them that challenge to overcome. So uh, I did check segment three out real quickly on the question. So these are different questions. This follow up was like comparing it to the rest of you know other games out there, which you answered. And the one in segment three is comparing them to each other. So uh, yeah. that, that's okay, the so new that's the nuance her. of that. What's you that? Yes, yeah, exactly. So, uh, all right. Uh, well, I wrote down a couple of notes. If you want to gain more... Now, first of all, if Rifts needs to change something, <laughs> if Palladium needs to change something, and I get it, it's it's hilarious, but to new people, it's confusing. I don't have a problem with it. I know I'm putting a lot of disclaimers out here, and I hate disclaimers, but, it, but I, I don't care. But it does cause problems for new people, is that potential psychic energy is magic power, while inner strength points is psychic power, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So that's confusing. That, you know that that little term, not, but again, longtime Rifts players are, or Palladium players aren't, aren't going to care about that. But it does. It is a little confusing in new people. And if you want to increase your your PPE, Kevin's going to hate me and never come on the show again. But kill babies. Just saying. That's how you do it. <laughs> Animals. Yeah. No, I kill want all the PPE. Kill the baby. Babies yeah. are more effective. Yeah, there's, that's that's a definite part of the system that that warrants some of the warnings in the uh, you know the, the the stock warnings at the front of every one of their books about. Supernatural. Well, it's also only evil characters are going to do that, and Palladium has the best alignment system ever developed, as far as Absolutely. I'm concerned. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, now, a couple of comments that I had in here. Uh, we'll go back to this one. So. 
two I have two notes about character creation. The first one is that a lot of times people can play, especially in rifts, but all the Playdom games can get this this bad rap, so to speak. It takes so long to make a character. There's truth to that, but there's a caveat. Everything is on your character sheet. Heathen Dog and I talk about this all the time. You barely need the book anymore once your character is done because it's all in your character sheet. Now, personally, I don't like the standard Palladium character sheets. I do my own thing in a notebook. Your mileage may vary. I'm not complaining about Palladium on this one, but if you've got it in a notebook, you'll have 10 pages of character notes on there, but it's all there. You might have to reference the rule because you haven't done vehicle combat in a while or something like that, but you have everything on your character sheet. It is the most comprehensive character creation of, I don't want to say any game I've ever played, but uh, that I can remember of any game I've ever played. It's all right there. So so when you are intimidated by the, oh my God, this is going to take me two, three, four hours, whatever, to make a character, don't be. Some of that's analysis paralysis on your part, and some of that is just how in-depth you can go with the character. And But once it's done, once it's there, you've got you've got that character, and you are literally ready to go with everything that your character can do. Any comments on that? Uh, you mentioned, and, and sorry for interrupting uh, the others, but in one of the future segments, we're going to talk about some of those tips and tricks mm -hmm. um, for for new GMs and new players. Um, but that's one of those things is just come with a prepared character or just kind of guide them into what the skill selections are for what they really need. And then they just tell them, like, pick, pick some at random. And if that includes like cooking, singing, and fishing, which they might not ever use within the terms of the actual adventure they're going to play, the module that you're going to throw at them right away, that's fine. Um, and, and you know what? If they want, they can change characters for the next one. They understand the process now. So it, the first time when you create a character in Rifts, it is, it is daunting. But let me tell you, my first time creating a character in Pathfinder that that took just as long as any palladium character i have ever looked at because it, you know there, there's tech trees and all these other ways that you can develop feet system i had not played around with so it was a new thing for me um the same thing with DD, the same thing with star wars vampire whatever game it is that you're going into you're starting to new uh, a new character you you've got a learning curve to overcome uh, Rifts uh, has some particular hazards that uh, don't necessarily help new players come into it, um, but there are ways to get around that. And, and so, so I'm, I'm going to interrupt for a second because because I, 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 this is a perfect point for me to say that the difference is in Pathfinder. You mentioned it. You didn't take the right feat. You didn't optimize. While there are ways to do it in some sense, I don't think there's a way to optimize a Rift's character. There's a way... Yeah, sure, some skills, like you said, are used potentially more than others, but what type of campaign are you playing? Those those cooking and fishing skills you said aren't important now might be really important three adventures down, so you, so you never know. Um, yeah. I think that Rift's encourages you to make your character vices the character. And I hate the term build. I'm with the old geek on this one. I hate the term build, but it makes so much sense when you're talking Watsy uh, third edition or you're talking Pathfinder. You really are building a character where in Rift's you're, 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 ma you're just making, you're, you're creating, you're crafting, whatever, a character based on your imagination. And pardon me for interrupting, but, but I thought that was a good point to kind of add in there. No, I think that you got it right on the head, and 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 I'm sure uh, Tim and Malachi would have some points on this. Rifts uh, and and Palladium system in general allows you to craft a character to um, your vision of what you want to do, and there is more than enough flexibility in terms of skills, uh, psionics, bio bionics, whatever it is that you're going to do, um, to to at the very least reach, let's say, the eighty percent goal of mm -hmm. what you want to get to. Might not be the hundred percent solution, but it's the eighty percent solution. And then with the game master in the adventures, you can definitely enjoy playing the character that you have created, and it gives you something to work for. Absolutely. The one thing about uh, that, especially riffs, um, as opposed to Watsy, as opposed to Pathfinder, uh, it's front. It, it's this is why it's so daunting for new players. And once you get a couple characters. And you learn on their ins and outs, but it's front loaded. Yep. Everything you need 
for that character is right off the bat, first level. Mm -hmm. That's why you, there is no feats. There is because you don't need it. It's right there. There, there. there is no no class progression. It's right there. I mean, you you're already you're doing your job. You know, you're just getting. You're, you're considered a professional at that point of some degree, right? Yes. Whereas in in the other system, you're not considered a professional until your fifth level or more. Blading, you are the professional. You're just improving your skill set. Um, so that's that's the yeah. And when it comes to character sheets, that's why I use the Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> it's it, sure. it does streamline it a bit. All right. Um, Malachi, do you want to say anything on that, or should I go to my second nope. point? Okay. My second point, this goes back to the, the follow-up question that I asked um, uh, Timothy Frelli. So I've got some suggestions. So, so in terms of, like, I want to play, I, I know a bunch of people put in chat, well, this is how you do the Predator. It's in this book, and you can grab it. Okay. That's a great start. I guess I'm talking about the idea, I imagine something that may or may not exist. Well, let's just arbitrarily say it doesn't exist. I think the first thing that you can do, well, first of all, a game master can always say no. And, and, and even Kevin and Sean say, look, if it doesn't fit your game, don't allow it in your game. Just because it is the kitchen sink doesn't mean you have to throw the, the cat's hairball in there with it. But with that said, you have to be cats, can you tell? Um, but with that said, first, and I think Timothy kind of, actually, he didn't kind of say, he actually said, find an OCC that matches. If you find an OCC that matches, what was it, Frank said there's like 400 OCCs? Wow. Okay. You know, you can find something that matches. But let's say you don't have the book or let's say, no, this I, I, it's just not quite right. I'm looking for something else. Um, find something just similar and then tweak it. You're allowed to do that. Make it your own OCC. Now, I wouldn't go in there and call it a glitter boy or uh, a elemental fusionist or, or a ley line walker because those already exist. But you can take those concepts and say, what if I did this a little differently? Maybe a little less PPE, but an, uh, but a little more on the ley lines. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know how you tweak all this stuff. But the, but the point is, is you have the ability to do that. You know, people complain that Rifts isn't balanced. Good. It isn't meant to be balanced. Do you know where it is balanced? Within your chosen field, so to speak. If you're a wilderness scout, you're a dang good wilderness scout. If you're a, a rogue scholar, you're a dang good rogue rogue scholar. If you're a Borg, you can take a lot of hits. <laughs> you know, I mean, the the idea is that you are good at your niche, and then you get uh, again using the book that uh, uh, that Timothy Frelly, and it's because I covered it. You got like nine, ten more wilderness scout ideas in there, so it's not like the game itself is limited to one version of the crazy. If you want the crazy, but something else, as long as you're staying within the tone and your game master approves it or your game master designs it, you can do it. Just base it on what you see there. There's no number system like, oh, I got to fit these points in or I got to do this or it's worth this much XP. Just make it. If you find out that it's OP, tweak it. If you find out that it's UP, well, make sure that your campaign, first of all, isn't wrong for the character class, but just fix it. You can do that. Rifts do a lot of weird things to people. You know, you walk too close to a ley line, you got a little jolt, and now something changed. You know? Th thoughts? Did I, did I go astray? Is that a good idea? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, then. Let's, uh, let's read some super chats, and then let's get on to the next segment. So we'll be talking about challenges with Rifts and the solution to those challenges in the next video. Uh, for people watching live next segment, sorry. But uh, let's hit these super chats here, up here. Boom. First, uh, I thought this was funny. This was good, Nerd Yogurt. This was good. Rifts isn't the only post-apocalyptic game out there. There's also <laughs> Splicers, Mechanoids, Chaos, or Dead Rain, and System Failure. All Palladium games, by the way. And wait a second. Oh, Chaos Earth is post-apocalyptic, but uh, the rest are, are SDC games, aren't they? No, no Mechanoids is MDC. It's apocalyptic. It's not post. Oh, it's steering the apocalypse. Fair. Okay. You know what? <laughs> oh. oh, my God. Are we going to get well, actually, like we did in the last stream? Well, actually. <laughs> hey. I'm the out now, guy. I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Mechanoids is MDC. Yeah, it is. That's SDC. No, the original Mechanoids. Trilogy. Uh, the original, well, I think, was SDC as well. Well, the, the, the blue books, I'm pretty sure, had MDC in them. When we covered yeah, them. The collected... Could've... You're yeah, talking yeah. about these ones, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not talking about the original. I'm talking about the compilation because I don't have the original, but I thought it was MDC. Yeah. No, it's SDC. Uh, first was. Yeah, oh, okay. SDC with armor rating. Okay. 
but yeah. stand correct. Robotech. Yeah. That's the first NDC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if, does, uh, Frank earlier Frank said you know you don't need a lot of books to start this, and he's right. Um, my my Saturday game, Dinosaur Swamp, like, and Chaos Earth. My players are using material from Chaos Earth because that's the start of their town. What is a platoon of of soldiers from Chaos Earth? And they're isolated. That's what they've got to work with. All right, here's a question for everybody. Please make your answer somewhat quick, but go ahead and give a good answer to this. What do you guys think is the main advantage of grabbing Rift's Ultimate Edition? Pictures. Okay. There's a lot of good yeah. art in it, especially the paintings. He's, um, he's not wrong. I mean, there, there's, a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of good art that came out after the original book. The original book had some fantastic artwork that did not translate into Ultimate Edition. Ultimate Edition did update uh, some of the OCCs uh, yeah. in particular. And, and you know, I've got on my blog uh, an OCC overview where I, I did a deep dive into each of the OCCs for um, in, in Ultimate Edition, compared them to the Rift's main book, which was back in the 90s. Uh, and some of them, lots of updates. Some of them, nearly none. Uh, or the updates were so inconsequential as to not really be uh, worth talking about. Um, and and from that perspective, it, it, it does give some of the non-combat OCCs a smidge of a glow up compared to what they were in the original book. Um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of the classes came through fairly well compared to, uh, or, or close to what they were in the original, which speaks volumes, I think, uh, to how well Rifts was originally designed in terms of what they were trying to achieve. And then some of the updates that they did throughout the decades since then. I mean, we're what, 2020, uh, what are we, 2024? Um, <laughs> like, like we're talking how many editions of D&D, Pathfinder, and all the other games that have come out since then. Uh, Rifts has largely, um, and this is one of the great benefits of the system, is all the world books, and there are 36 of them on the shelf behind me, just world books. Um, they are still using the exact same system that we were talking about 30 some odd years ago. So Rift's Ultimate Edition is a, a, a bit of a glow up in terms of the way that they presented some of the information. Um, I've got some. I've got an opinion about where, how they formatted the book uh, compared to the first one. <laughs> I think one. everybody <laughs> does. <laughs> uh, but uh, but Rift's Ultimate Edition. If you're if you're going to get into Rifts, I, I would strongly suggest the Ultimate Edition be book number one, and then the Adventure Guide be uh, mm, book yeah. Number. Oh yeah. Yes. And after that, conversion book one and the bestiary. And those are the first four books you need to run pretty much anything. And you're golden. Um, and, and it's going to cost you a heck of a lot less than what most other systems are going to ask you to pay. Mm -hmm. You know, is the not riffs guy. My favorite thing about riffs ultimate edition was I loved Kevin's notes in there. Especially when he yeah. had it, especially when he talked about the yes. juicer, because you know, as as a young gamer, it's like, ah, oh, juicer can do this. He's got all this stuff. Imagine no, I mean, just just putting the statement. And I'm like, I think I'm an intelligent guy. Maybe I'm not, because this never occurred to me. Imagine you you know you only have five ten years to live, and that is it. And uh, how are you going to live your life now? All those chemicals running. Yeah, you are. You are the prime you are the, the epitome of human capability because you are so coked up that that, uh, that you can do anything but it's also eating your body from the inside and how are you going to think about that I, just little notes like that that was my favorite part of riff's ultimate edition compared to the uh to the uh, was it the, what do you call the the main book now yeah uh, edition yeah <laughs> the riff's main book okay the riff's main book I call it the butts edition. Yeah, there's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, the Glitter Boys really kind of popularized that, um, uh, the Glitter Boys podcast. It's a hilarious um, misnomer that they give or, or, you know, the, the, the nickname that they give the book and, and for obvious reasons. Yeah. I, I think it's funny. That's yeah. I'm going to stick with it. When I, when I heard it the first time, I was like, what the heck are they? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> 
All right, let's uh, move on to our super chats now. Uh, Law Dog says Rift's magic and sonic system with ley lines and PPE and ISP are my favorite out of all the different systems out there. Mm-hmm. Not gonna lie, my favorite is actually Mage the Ascension. But I don't think that would work in Rifts. Uh, Law Dog also says, uh, this, by the way, thank you, Law Dog, for all the super chats. The sheer yeah. amount of, and variety of OCC RCCs makes a standard character sheet almost impossible to create. That is a very fair statement, which is a strength and not a weakness. Agree with you completely, in my opinion. Look, I know people like standardized character sheets. And to some degree, I do too, because it makes it really easy to glance at it, quickly look at it, make sure that, you know, the player isn't cheating or, hey, I mark something off or find your help, whatever. But I still have notebooks of characters, like my Borg character that I played in the 90s. I still have that character in a notebook uh, ready to go at any time. Just something about ha- that, that notebook, I can do what I want with it. I, I don't know. I, I don't have an issue with either. And and everything is there. I don't need the Rift's Ultimate Edition book. Everything's in that book. You know, what happens if I'm squatting with a bright sun in my eye while, you know, uh, while holding something over here and shooting with this arm? I'm sure I've got that written down on the character sheet somewhere. I can see a database having to be made to catalog all of the OCCs and RCCs. It's, uh, it's not fun. Um, <laughs> I, I did it. I my Excel spreadsheet for Men at Arms has over 200 different OCCs. That's including things like all the MOS options that you can find okay. for, like the Coalition Tech Officer. There's about seven different subsets. Mm-hmm. Effectively, it's seven different OCCs. Um, but when you look at it, um, if you were ever to, if Palladium was ever to move forward. And, and this is one of the things, and, and I've talked to Sean about this a couple of times, is if they were ever to move forward, uh, they would have to renegotiate how they look at their OCC system uh, from a start point moving forward. And they would have to normalize and rationalize a lot of the OCCs that are very much uh, simple, like the Spetsnaz in the Sovietsky book, World Book 36, uh, look and feel almost identical to a lot of the things you would find in the coalition states in terms of the technical officer, in terms of the military specialist, in terms of what you would find in NGR uh, and other books. We're uh, under seas with the new uh, with the navy. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's a lot of those that could be condensed into basically one OCC that could just then be played in Germany, in Russia, in North America or in Japan. Um, it's just a minor tweak, add a different language or two, uh, and then off you go. Um, yeah. But but for them to do that w- would require a significant amount of effort. And you know it, it could be done if they normalized it moving forward. All right, let's continue on here. Da, 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 da. Uh, Law Dog says for $5, thank you, Law Dog. The more characters you make, the faster it gets. If you've been playing for a while, you can knock out a character in a half an hour. I can't do that when I make a Borg, but that's because I'm buying all my parts. So, you know, <laughs> but yes, I, I agree with him. That's true with any system, though. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think, but I think a good uh, super chat like that is good to alleviate some of the folks like, oh my God, it takes forever. Well, a, a lot of people just have analysis paralysis. I even get that. It's like, I don't know. Do I want these set of skills or these set of skills? Like, I love this type, but this might be, uh, you know, what do I want to do with this character? Do I want to be different than my last one? Do I have some similarities? Do I, how do I want to, th- I don't know. So I do sometimes get the analysis paralysis when I'm, especially when I'm thinking about the skills. Come to character dice. I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> Uh, and you can find the link to his channel in the description. Where is it? Oh, there we go. Uh, Law Dog for $2. Says everyone, like and subscribe to help the channel. Share, share, share. Sharing is caring right now. Oh, and uh, for the comments that I've been getting recently about why are there so many uh, commercials in your videos? So I have two options. And by the way, uh, Gaming with ADHD, if you're still watching, I think I had a commercial every 30 second of your hour and a half video. Holy crap. YouTube is pushing out apparently a billion videos. And I think every one of them was a Kamala Harris video or or a commercial. So yeah, um, I think it's a YouTube thing right now. My only other option then is I can turn that off. But are you going to give provide super thanks? 
you know, so, you know, that, that that's the other side. I happily turn it off. I don't like ads. You don't like ads. Nobody likes ads. And, you know, YouTube's getting weird with the ad blockers. But then uh, are you going to donate on Ko-Fi or, or Super Thanks? You know, so right now, this is how I get a little extra residual income. But yes, please like and subscribe. Uh, Law Dog also says Riffs uh, walked up to balance, punched him in the dick, <laughs> stole his girlfriend, and then rode away in the sunset with her uh, on his motorcycle. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the thing. It's like balance is, and, and I have a, a, a community post out there that talks about balance. And my God, this segment one has taken forever. So I probably shouldn't comment on every little thing, but I need to because it was paid for. Um, I have a. a where we talk about, I think, some of the balance stuff. And it's funny because people complain, balance, 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 balance. But then when I put that question out there, almost everybody's like, no, nobody wants balance in riffs. doesn't make sense to have. Why would you balance a rogue scholar with a, uh, with, with, a, with a juicer? It doesn't make any sense to do that. Know your lane. Know your role. Can a rogue scholar shoot a, a mega damaged firearm and hurt somebody? Yes. Is he going to do it as effectively as a juicer? Not a chance in heck. That's just not his role. But he can certainly provide some firing cover. And you know what? Even that juicer has to dodge that. Okay, he's got auto dodge. But he's he's got to dodge that that shot, right? So he's still effective out there. Just don't put him in the front lines. That have him have have him uh, uh, you know hack the computer systems that turns the turrets on that circle. <laughs> so that juicer's bounced around like Yoda in, in Attack of the Clones. Well, guess what? <laughs> now he needs to. You know. Balance is the setting. You know, yes. the, the, the robot pilot has the same chance of survival as the wilderness scout. Well, kind of a little bit, not quite, but. Yeah, still. robot pilots, their robots rushed in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, was it, uh, oh my God, the desert, not no, no, the swamp, dinosaur swamp. I want yeah. to call it the desert swamp for some reason. <laughs> that was yeah, weird. I mean, um, Chris Lee Beardo over on uh, Rumble says, okay, who made a Borg with an extra set of arms just so he could shred on a double neck guitar? Be honest. <laughs> I did. I would. Yep. And it's, it's in New West, known. too. That's oh. probably why I don't like New West. Uh <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I get it. I do get it. And thank you for the $2, Chris Lee Beardo. Uh, we got, okay, now we got this one. Uh, Rift's Ultimate Edition includes in a lot of the Rifter material and things from other books, like Cyber Knights getting the Siege on Tolkien stuff added to the Rift's Ultimate Edition. Yeah, I mean, the, the book is technically in the future from the original book, so it's going to have that stuff incorporated in there. And then finally, and then we're going to go into the next segment because this one's been a crazy long. None of us are going to get sleep tonight. Um, the amount of variety in riffs is intimidating to a lot of people new to the game. And you know, that's a great segue as we go into our second segment, which is going to be on challenges and solutions. Heathen Dog says, I say, says it the best. He says, riffs is the best second game you should play. You should have something else under your head. I hear click, click, click again. Uh, uh, you should have something under your belt first. Uh, before you go into it uh, to ease you into it a little bit better not that you can't you absolutely can but it's probably something that you should you know you might be better off having something else under your belt so that you aren't so intimidated I, right. actually, I actually would think the opposite um oh if, really okay cool if you have somebody uh to mentor the game master before you dive into it right? and and uh, I, I gotta put that out there there is a, a mentorship aspect to uh, Rifts diving into that in the first as your first game, um, and and we'll get into this in this segment for sure. Um, but but I think the Palladium system is set up in such a way that it would provide the game master so many tools and flexibility, and the players such a wide variety of things to play with that they would almost find some of the other games that are common out there, especially the D twenty systems. Uh, almost, uh, almost restrictive. Like you're wearing a shirt that's got a collar that's a little too tight. Um, <laughs> I, I, I found the Palladium system to be just absolutely almost too easy to manipulate and to uh, allow for players to come in and do their thing, have fun doing it without thinking too much about the system and how many hexes are we moving? Yep. Uh, am, am I able to run far enough to do something while also X, Y, Z? Um, it's just theater of the mind. Go. 
I I agree completely. Again, not the Rift guy, but I do other Palladium games. I, uh, I, I, I agree. I'm with that working completely. on it. I'm I'm trying to. I'm. This is the aim of my my being here is to try and convince you, Max, to get out of whatever it is that you're playing and get into. <laughs> well, and what's what's funny that you say that is because just having Kevin and Sean on has softened my stance towards Rifts because I used to say oh, I hate Rifts. Now it's like, and and I've played Rifts. It's just now I'm like I get Rifts. I didn't actually get it at first. All the things that I think are wrong about the game are intended in the game so i thought how do i say this i thought it was overdone like i don't think he intended all this stuff no he, no human mind can intend for all this stuff and then i come to find out no he actually did it's like oh well okay if you intended for that i get it I, i've softened my stance on it i still prefer you know after the bomb but i've softened my stance on it no. All right, let's uh, let me get this uh, last thing up here. All right, if you think you have some presence and charisma, if you think you're better than these three fine folks that I have on the screen right now, uh, and the ability to entertain and educate, a good AV setup free from noise pollution and Malachi's click, 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 and an interest in discussing tabletop RPGs in this format, join the Some Rando RPG live stream Discord. And to the folks out there who've you know said, uh, can you get a hold of me on Twitter? No, I'm not doing Twitter. I'm not doing Facebook. I'm not doing your website. I'm not sending emails. There's a Discord for this, and it's set up just for the purpose of announcing these streams, getting people on these streams, and helping you be prepared for these streams. So that's where it's going to be. You can find that in, there's a link in the description. So stay tuned for future topics. The entirety of the topics are set up through the end of the year, and there's still potentially room for you to join. So uh, help us get to know you, and maybe we'll get you on the show. And of course, if you enjoy this discussion, please like this video, subscribe to all of the panelists' channels, their Substacks, their YouTubes, their, their scholarly adventure websites, whatever, uh, which you can find in the description.